We talked on the show this week about what might be happening in the Kremlin. Always hard to know for sure, of course, particularly now. There's general agreement that President Putin's war in Ukraine is not going as well as he'd hoped. By some accounts, no one will tell him how badly it's going. Other reports say he knows how badly it's going and he's in making lots of decisions about what's going on on the battlefield. Well, let's hear from Christopher Steele, who was a British government intelligence professional and a Russia expert. He wrote the dossier on alleged collusion between Russia and Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Welcome. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, but what do you think is happening in the Kremlin? Our understanding is that there's increasing disarray in the Kremlin and chaos, in fact, that um, there's no clear political leadership coming from Putin, who is increasingly ill, and that in the military's terms, the, um, the structures of command and so on are not functioning as they should. And as an example of that, the chief of the general staff, Gerasimov, has basically disappeared. I mean, there were rumors last week that he had been injured, but he actually hasn't been seen in his office for the last week either. So he's either been dismissed or injured or both. And when you go down to the front itself, the appointment of Dvornikov, the so-called butcher of Syria, um, a month or so ago by Putin to command the front. He does seem to be in charge of the eastern part of the front, but not the south or Crimea. So it looks increasingly febrile, increasingly unstable inside the Kremlin. How confident can we be about all of that? I think we can be fairly confident. I don't think we can predict necessarily what comes out of it, because the talk is that if anybody is going to replace Putin, it's going to be somebody more, well, not hardline, but more hardline than Putin, someone like Bortnikov or Patrushev, um, and that that isn't necessarily good news. But what it does underline is the fact that politically, Putin can't really draw back from the war or come to some kind of peace deal with the Ukrainians at the moment uh, because of the sort of political corner he's painted himself into. Uh, what do we know about his health? We don't know the exact details of what his ailment is. What we do know is that um, he's constantly um, accompanied around the place by a team of doctors, that many of the um, set-piece shows on television and so on, meetings of the Security Council that are shown to supposedly last for a whole hour, are actually broken up into several sections and that he goes out and receives some kind of medical treatment between those sections. And so clearly he is seriously ill. I mean, how terminal or incurable it is is not clear. Uh, whether it's cancer or Parkinson's, it probably is, but we can't be entirely sure. But it's certainly having a very serious impact on the governance of Russia at the moment. Why would his, his, his unknown illness have such an impact? I think for a couple of reasons. One is because it's probably driving his wish to solidify his legacy, as he sees it, which is grabbing parts of Ukraine or, at the beginning, the whole of Ukraine. But also, the Russian Kremlin is a bit like a shark pool. They all swim round, and if they smell blood in the water or taste blood in the water, they start fighting. And I, I think there's a, going to be a series of vacuum, power vacuum in the Kremlin soon if things continue the way that they are. Is it inevitable that whoever might replace President Putin, whenever that is, will be more hardline? Are there any, any dove-like, comparatively speaking, dove-like figures uh, waiting in the wings? I wouldn't call them dove-like. I think there are people who are more pragmatic and who aren't sort of entirely hitched to the war. And although they might not be ideal interlocutors for the West, they still may be people who have political room of manoeuvre to come to some kind of deal and peace deal with Ukrainians and end this war, which is such a disaster for Russia in the longer term. And assuming your thinking is right, let's take that at, at face value. Is the disarray in the Kremlin uh, caused by what's going wrong on the ground in Ukraine or is, what's going, or is it going wrong on the ground because of the disarray in the Kremlin? It's a sort of self-fulfilling um, spiral, I think. So I, I think that the big problem with this war is the, is the lack of candid information um, dis diffusion both up and down in the system. People were afraid to tell Putin things he didn't want to hear. And I think that's become almost uncontrollable now. And that although on the economic side, people are prepared, like the central bank governor, to stand up to him, 
the military all seem to be engaged in a blame game to blame each other and to try and avoid actually addressing the problems of this war where the Russian army has performed particularly badly and certainly much worse than any of us expected. I wonder how uh, Western countries should respond then uh, to all of this information, how they should deal with President Putin. I think I don't think we can really deal with Putin other than talking about ending the war if he's prepared to do that. I don't think he can be our interlocutor going forward in any meaningful sense. However, I think some of the people around him, even those who may be fairly hardline, could possibly be interlocutors going forward, certainly on an interim basis before some kind of more stable government is established in Russia. There are some very capable people in the Russian government. It's just that they're not calling the shots at the moment over this war. Do you think the wheels are coming off? I do, yes. Thank you for talking to us. Christopher Steele, who was a British government intelligence professional and is a Russia expert. 5.45, Amelia has the headlines.